Okay, okay, since everyone is seated, uh, why don't we start? Okay, start the year. Uh, so thanks for coming. This is our room meetup. So uh, talking about Ruby and related technology. If you're here for PHP, probably not so related. Uh, another meetup perhaps. Go to go and see Michael. <laughs> Michael is the head of the PHP one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thanks for coming. We have pizzas. Uh, and drinks over there. Uh, but firstly, uh, thank you to our sponsor, um, Silicon Straits, for sponsoring this panel. Um, James is not free today, uh, but this space is uh, James, James Chan. So um, Silicon Straits is sort of like a co working space as you can see around here. We also have a dev shop uh, in Vietnam um, that's doing like a lot of good uh, development work. So if you need any of such help, uh, look for James Chan. Um, Food today is sponsored by Engine Yard. So thank you, Engine Yard. Um, they will be sponsoring next month's food as well, and probably the month after. Uh, so say thank you to them for the pizzas. Um, so last month we were here as well. Um, there were a lot of people. So <laughs> this month not a lot. I probably need to like plot the graph to see <laughs> why is there a fluctuation of attendance, you know, throughout the months. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you are looking to speak, uh, share what you know about Ruby, about your work, etc. Please feel free to ping me, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it's all okay. Uh, but probably you have to queue up uh, for next year, because in December, we will have um, two, two bigger speakers. Uh, you guys are big speakers, bigger speakers. Uh, so they will be from Engine Yard and from GitHub. Uh, so we have these two uh, speakers lined up for December. So if you want to talk, probably uh, in January or in February. Alright? But please email me. If you want to sponsor, if your company wants to sponsor as well, food, drinks, uh, alcohol, etc. Uh, you have feedback or suggestions with regards to how you run a meetup, uh, please feel free to email me as well. Or call me on Twitter, Monster by W. So anyone first time to do the meetup? Okay, excellent. I hope you'll come again <laughs> next month. Uh, any companies looking to hire? Uh, would you guys want to give like a pitch for a company? So maybe towards the end of the session, I'll give you guys the message. All right. Okay. Uh, so today we have two talks. Uh, the first one is install native dependencies using native gem. Uh, like you're waiting from favorite medium. Um, next is Hello Elixir by Benjamin. And finally, we have five random meetings by Chongyi. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Quim. Uh, so you might want to stand over here. But uh, yeah, most importantly, thank you, Michael, for coming down today uh, to help with the video recording. It's the first time I'm doing a video recording. Uh, he has big plans for what to do with the video recording. If you want to know more, please look for Michael. Uh, it's something to do with engineers.sg. Basically, it's called natives. Um, one line it lists native packages required by the Ruby gems. So, um, so today I will go through the problem that I faced, uh, and then I'll talk about the gem, how it solved my problems, and the stuff I learned, and also I'll talk about something that uh, I may need your help to contribute to this project. So I think I'm one of the new faces here. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Hui Ming. Um, you can call me Ming if you uh, 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 And currently I'm a software engineer at <coughs> Favorite Medium. So we built uh, at Favorite Medium. We built and we design both web and mobile applications. So uh, I will upload these uh, slides to SpeakerNet. So this is my handle. 
So yeah, so this is the problem. <coughs> so anyone faced this problem before? Like when you first time bundle install. So you see something like error install, copy bar, copy. So yeah. so this is basically I think everyone familiar with this problem right? because Kakibara WebKit needs a native dependency or native packages in order to work correctly. So, so one of the like, what usually people do when 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 bundle install throw this this error. So uh, so you can be like we go and Google the error message. Or usually I find it, found it in Stack Overflow answer. And so if you're lucky, you can get it in uh, the Ruby Gems Fitme or Wiki. Or if you are more lucky, your your app is already set up with the Ruby, uh, with what like what installation that you need to uh, do before you want to install. Or even luckier if you have a set up message that already automate that process for you. So so yeah, so so imagine you have to do this on uh, dev, your dev machine first. And then after that, you have to repeat this again uh, in your production environment. So isn't that if, what if I have a, like a catalog, uh, a catalog of Ruby gems, native packages, and it's machine readable. And it works on both uh, development and production environment. So that, that's what I initially like, thought about and start playing around this concept. And yeah, be before this, do you guys have any other methods besides like, how to manage your native <coughs> dependencies? Any, anyone want to share? Any other ways that you can use? So this is basically what we do at the Google. Yeah, this is what I do. So, so yeah. So this is why I come up with the like, talking around it, this idea. Uh, so it's, if you want to try out today, you can just uh, just install pages. Uh, so how you use it? How do you use it? So you can see here uh, on the back, we just run natives list, and then provide the Ruby Jack names uh, that you, you you know that it has uh, they have native dependencies. So for example, if you run it on Mac, you will show that oh, Kabibara, what kid is QT, our native needs our magic. So for Ubuntu, if you run this, you will get a different results. So here you can see here. So, how do you use it? So you can use it to pipe it into any um, installer, package installer uh, on, your, on your OS. So for example, for Mac, go install. Just pipe it with the other parameters. And you can do it the same on the user. So, yeah, so it also support one uh, feature here. So if you are too lazy to like type all these Ruby gems, uh, if you have a gem file and it has a log file, so we know that like all the gems are required, so we can just uh, specify what gem file you use. So this is basically a feedback from our colleague Hunting sitting there. So this is the first feature request that I got. So work on that one, and I use just for your information, I use Vanilla. I tried a few methods, but I ended up using this one, but a lot of file master. So, but it requires a giant dot log in order to work. So, so how it basically works is it, it detects the platform that you are using. So, when you run native detect, it will print out uh, the host detection results. So, for example, this one is on my Mac book, so it shows. Mac OS X, and then platform version, and also the package provider, uh, Homebrew. So it will detect whether you install Homebrew or Mac OS. So 
This one, the back and I mean, in the background, I use I use Chef Ohai. It's an open source gem that helps to detect platform used by Chef. And also, uh, instead of using the heavyweight Chef platform, Chef Solo thing, I I extracted out the information so that we can detect the uh, package provider. So. So the, the, the most important thing in this gem is this demo file. It's a catalog. So remember what I mentioned, like what if we have a catalog of native uh, uh, packages? So you can see here, uh, we ship with the gem together. And if you have a like, project specific catalog, you do not want to share. Like, I, I encourage everyone to, uh, if possible, to patch this uh, catalog. Uh, but if you don't want to, you can you always load from your current directory uh, native catalogs folder. You we'll look for this file. Uh, it's a YAML file, and you can see here it's very simply, very like, self-descriptive. I started with the catalog name, it's Ruby Jam. And this is the uh, Ruby Jam name on the viral web kit. And here you have the package provider. And so this one is like a default version of Capybara WebKit. Uh, sorry, the default version of the platform. So, so by default, like all platform that runs uh, Homebrew, uh, we can treat it like it's pretty. So another example here is like for AppGet in Ubuntu. So because AppGet exists in more than one platform, for example, Debian, Mint, Ubuntu. So maybe by default, uh, for all app, uh, by default we need this this native library. And for specifically for Ubuntu, this version uh, we need this. So you can use this uh, simple by demo to describe what uh, what you need. So yeah. Quick question: that would that be hard to get a solution from the home? Do you look at both with QT WebKit and QT WebKit or just get all of those So, do we like, like we have like multiple sets like for apps if you're using apt and you're using Ubuntu, um, would you get the requirements list under default plus the requirements list? Or? Well, we don't work. So, you will only choose one. Like, for example, okay. you are on Ubuntu 10.04, then you will choose this one. Okay. If you are on Ubuntu, 12, so we cannot find anyone here. Okay. So it will use the default. It makes the most specific one of ones. Yeah. So any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. So this one, um, I then after that I realized like we can use this for general purpose, uh, just to with a general purpose catalog. So imagine that Node.js, if we use at the end, uh, you can specify a at the end uh, catalog, and you just so in the command line uh, tool, I provide a flag there, the catalog, so you can just choose. So it, it choose based on this name of them. So if you say you have a catalog with follow at the end, you can use that. You just specify, and yeah, basically you can do whatever you can specify whatever you want. Uh, it's, it's not limited to the regions. So yeah, so currently it's uh, still beta very early. Uh, but it's working, so uh, it's it's licensed under MIT, so everyone feel free to feedback to request uh, those who are coming. And, and of course, currently the catalog is very uh, short, release. so if anyone interested, I think if you find it useful, you want to use it, uh, feel free to patch it. So, so this is my account. Uh, uh, it's live under GitHub, uh, T O H natives. Uh, no interest in can take a look. So yeah, so maybe I'll talk about a bit, a few things I learned. <coughs> so the first one, uh, do one thing. So this this was the first version. I was thinking like, oh, what if? Because this project initially, I, I was like inspired by uh, the Chef project. So using Chef, you can install basically 
anything on any platform. So I was thinking like, why not I just reduce everything in, in Chef so, so this was the first version I used, like native install and uh, specify the jams. And it will internally will run a chef solo and it ship with this jam ship with the uh, chef cookbooks. Um, but it ended up with like, too many dependencies. Like, imagine if you want to install this on a fresh server, there are too many dependencies uh, in, in chef. So yeah, so so then I, I decided that why not just do one thing, uh, do one thing wrong. just to list it and we can use it in the different uh, use cases. Another thing probably mentioned just now, I tried a few ways to try to pass the jam file parsing. I started with the jam uh, bundle show. So it will list all the gems, yeah, print out all the gems, and then I try to get it from the standard out. I mean, it's too cumbersome, it's, it's error prone. Then I, I found out that there is one problem specs. This is not working very well with, if you are running already a copy of, I mean, if you are running this gem in a bundle exit exact already, so this one behaves great. So in the end, I end up using this, this one. So it's good. It doesn't consume any network effort. Just uh, look for the log file. And then uh, pass it. This, this are all the way. What are these returns? It will return you gems version or just? Uh, it returns the, the spec object. Okay. It's something like it's similar to this one. It returns a full spec object. Inside there, you can get the Ruby Gemini version, the dependencies, mm -hmm. everything. Okay. So, so, this is also like when I started. I mentioned I, I inspired, I borrowed a lot of things from the chef. So the, the catalog format is uh, is basically copy one. Uh, I think if, if you, anyone here is familiar with chef, you notice there's one function called DSL called value for platform. Basically, it will take like, this this part and then it will tell like return. It will detect the platform first and then return the correct battery value. So this was the first proof of concept that I was working on this time. And then I realized that with for my Mac OS, if someone is using Mac Pods but I'm using Cold Brew, then how how do I do that? So so I just like hack hack it to uh, just add one slash Cold Brew into the demo. Then recently I found out. Maybe it's better just to put it out there. So, so you can describe a case like for this is useful for AppCat. Like for AppCat, maybe all the platforms like Ubuntu, Main, Debian, we all use one default package. But maybe for Ubuntu specific one, uh, we, we need to like, if there is a specific package we want to use. So this this format uh, is able to handle that. Yeah, so for this one, catalog. So I also started working on a um, very simple testing framework to test, to verify the entries in my catalog. So basically, this is what I do for each jam uh, that written in the catalog file. I will launch a platform in virtual machine and then install the native packages using maybe app install or yet to install. And then after that, try to install it again. If it works, then I consider it success. Otherwise, fail. So currently, I, I have a working prototype now uh, in ship together with the jam as well. Uh, it's running using Raven plus Docker. Uh, I used to do parallel, try to like, do it, make it faster, like running two tests at a time. But it, it will take, take a while to finish the test. What I'm trying to do next is maybe try out Test Kitchen. It's another project by uh, uh, Chef Community uh, to run stuff, uh, to test, test stuff parallel in the virtual machine. Uh, so this setup, for Docker setup, uh, I recommend, if you are interested, I recommend this uh, blog post. Uh, it's written by the IQ. They, they, have a, they had a hackathon 
to basically convert their uh, development environment into Docker in 24 hours. So they have a lot of information and also they publish the, uh, uh, the, the code, the source code, uh, freely. So it's available uh, on the basement. Yeah, so uh, what's, the, what's next? So what I plan to do is probably the first thing is try to get people to uh, contribute to populate this catalog, if anyone is interested. Uh, yeah, we also like, think about, like, uh, our colleague is thinking about, like, is there a better way to, to, to collaborate this effort? Or maybe, uh, I think the easiest way is to do a to request. If, if anyone has a better idea, for example, you share it on the spreadsheet and then you convert it into the YAML file, export it. So that's the one. And the second one, probably I want to work on the kind of testing framework. So yeah, so that's about it. So is there like for example for gems like Kemibara and right? Do they specify native dependencies within their gem spec or anything? Or gem spec? Not that like I like in their project today? In wiki page. Only in wiki page. I'm not sure about the gem spec. So far I don't I don't think there's a few that I don't have right. Because I'm thinking if they specify it somewhere, then maybe you can automate by calling all the gems and yeah, right. reading it out from. Yeah, I'm trying to check out the gems back. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's in gems. Or maybe if they return it in a machine processor. Yeah. Then, then we can parse it and just be pointed back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, if there is. Yeah, but I'm not sure I'll have to check. Would it be better to have one file per gem instead of one file? <coughs> Would it be better rather than having one catalog that's got like all the gems in to have like one file for each of the gem dependencies? Because I think that might make, make it easier for people to submit. Um, oh, you mean like one gem per file? One. Yeah, one, one like catalog file per, per gem, just as the dependencies for that. Because I'm thinking if they want to make pull requests for the catalog, it's kind of difficult to. Yeah, it might work. What do you mean? Do you, do you mean like you have multiple catalogs for? Um, just have a directory of, of YAML files that's got the one for each of the, the gems that, um, that each list its own dependencies. Because um, at the moment you just have one catalog file that you can the Okay, all the gems in. Yeah, maybe we can talk about this. Yeah, this, this format, I mean the catalog format is still pretty much we can change it if, if it. There's a better way to represent. What about those uh, like CentOS require like people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th yeah, this some I also noticed like there are other cases where you need to like provide extra flex, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this one currently uh, it doesn't handle it. Uh, so uh, I try to be simple first, like eighty percent of the case you can use this. But I'm thinking like like one of my ideas was like, is it possible to expand this? Instead of one string, we make it into maybe a hash, like to provide extra, I mean, this is the package name, and then extra flags or compile options. Yeah, but YAML gets weirder <laughs> when you get deeper, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, this is something to think about if you want to bring this like, that far. What's your catalog currently as of now? How many movie gems do you cover? It's, it's very little. Small. What do I have? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. It's, it's just less than 10, I guess. It's all the gems that uh, I actively use it in projects. Capybara, Curve, Local Unity, PG, Biometric, TSR. And SQLite. Right. So, so, yeah, so if anyone is interested, uh, pull requests is also up.
Nope, it's not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we have Benjamin. Uh, he will be talking to us about Alexa. So let's welcome Benjamin. Hello, uh, my name is Benjamin. Uh, this is the second time I'm giving a Ruby talk for Singapore Ruby Brigade. This happens to be my, also my second Ruby meetup. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, so today I'm going to talk to you about Elixir. Uh, it's this new programming language. It came out in 2011. Uh, it was invented by Jose Fallin. So in case you don't know who he is, he's a Rails committer, but you might be also using one of his gems. So anyone using device over here? Yeah, he's, probably, he's responsible for that also. So, let's begin. So in 15 minutes, plus plus, hopefully I can give you a brief introduction to Elixir and Erlang. I'll give you a very whirlwind tour of Elixir. And also, we'll look at some code, we'll see how to implement map, and also we'll look at how to implement parallel map. You all know what's map, right? Yes, it's exactly the same way that the Ruby map works. So, Elixir. Elixir is a functional, meta-programming-aware uh, language built on top of the Erlang virtual machine. This means that the um, Elixir code, when it compounds down, it is essentially Erlang by code. So what's Erlang? All the pink stuff are all the... Uh, yeah. So it's concurrent, garbage collector, functional, it's dynamic typing, it's distributed, fault tolerant, soft real time, non stop application, blah blah blah. All the buzz, passwords are all there. So, Elixir is a functional programming language. So it supports higher order functions. So um, over here, we have a very simple function. We can define a square function, assign it to a variable, and then we can call num map on a range 1 dot of 10, which really looks like Ruby ranges and then we can pass in the square function. So, it also has list comprehensions. Uh, really, it looks like Python's list comprehensions, and again, it gives you exactly what you expect. It also has streaming. So, uh, if you have done any Haskell before, you'll know that Haskell supports infinite streams. So, it, it, um, it elixirs the same thing. So, they are essentially lazy streams. So, over here, what we have is, um, this piece over here, generates an endless string of random ones and zeros. But if you just run that alone, you would essentially crash a computer. Because it will just go on and on and on. But over here, we can pipe it to a map. This is the pipe operator, I'll talk about it later. Uh, essentially, we can take, over here we can take five elements from this infinite string. Okay, so far. So, Let's talk about the pipe operator. I think this is one of the coolest features in uh, Elixir. So, look at this function over here. Uh, essentially, we have a list of lists. So you see the embedded one, two, three, four, and five. We want to flatten the list, so we call it list of flatten. So essentially, it's just one, two, three, four, five flatten list. And then what we want to do, we want to map it over a certain function. In this case, we run a queue. So we get the result 1827641125. That sucks. We have a better way. So this is essentially what the pipe function gives us. We have the, the list of this, we pipe it to list of flatten. What the pipe operator does is it takes in whatever was before and it puts it as the first argument. So same thing, once we have the flatten list, we can pass it through the enum.map function. So over here will be our flatter list, and then we will have our function over here. And again, this has the same result. So as with Erlang, Elixir has this uh, notion of concurrency, and it's called the actor concurrency model. So what this means is each actor is a process. So you could imagine like one of these little bubbles is an actor and a process at the same time. Each process performs a very specific task and each process communicates with each other using message passing. Um, each process is designed to just receive a particular kind of message. So if you are a process and you receive a message you don't understand, you simply ignore it. Processes do not share information with each other, so essentially uh, we eliminate things like race conditions. So, 
Here's some code. Um, I'll walk you through it. So, let's see. This is how we define a module in uh, uh, Elixir. So we have dev module and return. So the next line, we define a function. So this is how uh, in Elixir and Erlang also, how we receive messages, we define it within a receive block. So what follows are the patterns of messages we can receive. So for example, I can spawn out a return process and I pass it, uh, I pass it this uh, message in this pattern. Once I receive it, I will just simply output a uh, hello whatever message. In Ruby also, there's this uh, notion of an underscore operator. We call it a don't care operator. The guy use this in Ruby before. If you ever iterate through like key value uh, a, a hash, sometimes you don't care what the key value is. The key is you just put an underscore comma value. So essentially, this is, this is the same thing. So notice that when I call, uh, if I were to receive this message, uh, English comma name, let's say English Ben. Uh, notice once it prints out the message, it calls grid again. That's because if I don't have this, the process will simply exit. So I have to have a recursive call to myself in order to prepare myself to receive more messages. Okay, so let's see this in action. So over here, this is the way I spawn up a process in Elixir. So I can call greeter, which is the variable, and I spawn it. So the first parameter is the module name, the second parameter is the function name, and the third parameter is any arguments I wish to pass in. So in this case, there's nothing. So if I don't type this in the interpreter, what I'll get is the process ID of the process. So now assuming, okay, this is the way we send uh, messages to the process. So now, greeter is already my process. It contains the process ID. I can send it a message using this operator, uh, this arrow operator over here. So once I send, send it the message, uh, greeter understands what English comma A need. It just responds hello A need. So same thing with the Chinese greeting. So if I put pass in Chinese comma Ben, and it will just say Ni Hao Ben. But if I pass it something nonsensical, um, it will fall through all the way to the last case. It will match the underscore, and then it will just give me I don't understand, but hello anyway. Okay, so what? So let's, um, in Elixir and Erlang, we like to do a lot of recursion. Uh, because, as you know, functional programming languages are essentially immutable. So you don't have any for loops, you don't have any while loops. So the only way for us to loop around is recursion. So here's a very simple uh, map function. So same thing, we define the base case first. The base case is the empty, empty list. So if I give you an empty list, I should, or rather if I map over an empty list, I should get back the empty list. On the other hand, if I have a non-empty list, what I'll do is, I will break the list up into head and tail. So, do you all know what this operator is called? No? Anybody does closure? So essentially, this is the cons operator. Uh, what it does is, if I give you a list, let's say one, two, three, four, five, uh, this will take the value of one, and this will be a list of two, three, four, five. So what we have over here is that we take in the list, and a function. We apply the function to each element and then we recursively call map on the rest of the list. Okay? Okay. But now let's take it a notch further. Now we implement parallel map. So in Ruby, most of the time when we do map, it's just very sequential, right? But in Elixir and Erlang, we have a way of mapping uh, stuff parallelly. What I mean, for example, I have 1 million, I want to map over 1 to 1 million, and I'll do some funky operation on each of the uh, elements. So what this parallel map does is it spawns off 1 million processors, 
one million processors will go out and do their thing, and then when they're done, they'll return. And once every single process returns, ta-da, you get the rest of the list. Okay? So let me take you through it. So um, imagine that now we have a collection, let's say one to a million. So this will be this guy over here. Uh, we pipe it to Mac, and what this function does, essentially the interesting thing is here. We spawn off, for each element, we spawn off a separate process. So that's what the spawn link here is for. After that, we keep a reference to the process which is spawned. Okay? And then we set it, uh, and then we calculate what the function, uh, rather we apply the function to the element. So essentially we go and do the complex calculation. So at this point, once this and this operation, oops, once this operation completes, we have a map list of process IDs. Okay? So now we're gonna do the next transformation. The next transformation essentially converts each of these process IDs and teaches it to receive the result. So how does it know how does it know that all the elements come in order? So this is uh, what this thing, this operator does. So recall that each time I map, 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 I will return a process ID. So let's say I have a process ID 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. Okay. Once this process spawns off, gets back its result, it will send back a message to itself over here. It will send back a message to itself saying that, hey, I have completed. Give me back my result. And this is essentially what it does over here. So once that message matches, it returns the result over here. Okay? Sorry? It will return an order. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, like, because your process is returned at different times, right? So uh, yes, so, correct, so they are not in order. That is not guaranteed, which is the point anyway. So, like, the first element might take very long, but your second element might take very fast. Right, so it doesn't matter. But the point is, it, uh, you just spawn multiple processors to light up all your cores. So if you have four cores, you just use four cores. Once it's done, then you just gather everybody back together. Yeah, so basically that was a very, 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 very quick run through. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are a couple of resources. Um, the first two, one, two, yeah, there are two Elixir books written already. Uh, I recommend Programming Elixir by Dave Thomas, it's pretty good. Uh, Meet Elixir is a screencast, uh, it's recorded with Jose Valley, the author of Elixir. Um, the bottom two books are great if you want to learn more about Erlang. Like, So I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, I have stickers. I have Erlang stickers and I have Elixir stickers. <laughs> yes. So I mean, in order to be a legit programmer, you have to have stickers. So I'll just leave them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll leave them with Winston. So first come, first serve. I have more Erlang stickers than Elixir ones. Yeah. So what are you using Elixir in Erlang for right now? Nothing much. <laughs> I am trying to find an excuse to use it, but um, essentially I'm I'm just starting out. Because if, if you really dig deeper into um, Elixir, Elixir and Erlang, you realize that actually Erlang is huge. There's this thing in Erlang called OTP, which stands for Open Telecom Protocol, which is used to build like funky servers, uh, things like if you use Facebook and chat, the back end of that is essentially Erlang. So there's um, still a lot of stuff that is interesting and still have a time to learn it. What would you like to do? Um, Dream I want to start on a scraper. Uh, hasn't been terribly successful yet. A dream project, uh, I don't write a, I mean simple one would be just a chat server. Because I think one, one thing in school that I didn't learn was writing concurrent programs and parallel programs. 
So that's, I think, something we are I'm missing out on. And I mean, seriously, a lot of people are missing out on also. So I think um, Elixir might be the, just a the gateway drug just to do that. Can I spawn? This one always spawn a process that mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the processors in Elixir and Erlang are not the same as uh, your operating system ones. So the processors are actually really small. I think they measured it once before that, like it's in the order of nanoseconds to spawn up a process in Erlang. So everything is controlled within the Erlang virtual machine. So it's not the same as I think a Java one, where I think a Java um, thread map or process maps to an operating system one. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions? Nope. If not, thank you, Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, yes. Stickers. Oh, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, so feel free to get a sticker from me later. Uh, so I must apologize to Ming and Benjamin because, uh, okay, they weren't here last month, but for those who were here last month, you know that actually I got some uh, goodies from Engine Yard. Uh, I have t-shirts for oh. the speakers, so I gave out two for the last two speakers and I should be giving you guys one each as well, but I'm going to bring them today. <laughs> uh, so I'll bring them during, in the December meetup. So, oh, so that's why you're going to get me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you too. Then I'll, I'll give you the t-shirt the right. then. Alright, so sorry about that. Oh, sure. Good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So now we have uh, Chong Yi. Uh, he'll be going through like five random movie tips. Hi, Chong Yi. Hi. Hey, works. Um, please forgive me, this is my first ever tech talk. <laughs> and I'm also suffering from jet lag, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think worse for me than for you. Um, I'm just going to go through five quick movie tips. Uh, there are sort of varying degrees of um, you know advancement. Some of you I see uh, uh, maybe beginners to Ruby, so I hope you find something out of it. Um, the first one is if you're working on regular expressions, this is a great website. Uh, I don't know whether you've come across it. It's called Rubular. The URL is rubular.com, and what you can do is you can type in your uh, regular expression up there, and uh, you can type in your test string, and it will show you any matches plus all the match groups, which is wonderful for if you're testing out regular expressions. Uh, one tip I learned recently is that there is a make permalink uh, button there, and it will give you a URL which you can type in as a comment in your code, so you can always refer back to this, uh, this site with everything filled up, if you ever need to use it. Okay, rubler.com. And of course, there's a, a quick reference down there as well, which I always find very, very helpful. The second tip is, uh, using Bundler. Uh, the current version of Bundler does everything sequentially, so it goes through every gem and installs it in your gem file and all the dependencies. The new version of Bundler 1.4, which is in pre-release right now, would have a, uh, has an option to do it uh, uh, parallel installs. So if you want to try it out, do uh, gem, uh, install the Bundler gem, uh, the pre-release version, using that command there, and the way to invoke the parallel installs is bundle install minus j4. So j is for jobs, and the 4 is the number of, uh, number of threads you want it to go into. And the idea is you should use either the number of cores or n minus 1. Okay? And a couple of uh, links to blogs. First is uh, Prem Shishanagri's uh, blog, which uh, highlighted this first. And the second uh, URL is uh, to let you know that uh, Heroku is, has got experiment, experimental build pack that will allow you to run that on the road with the plot as well. Uh, so it's actually Bundler 1.5 RC yeah. already. So they skip 1.4. Fantastic. Because they said that there's too many things in 1.4 that decided just to go straight to 1.5. But it's in 1.5 RC, so okay. try it. Okay, read that as 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. Uh, another Bundler, bundler uh, tip is Bundler Console. And this is great if you're doing gen development. What it does is that if you type in Bundle Console, it will just load uh, IRB with all your uh, the environment with all the gems loaded in there. And it's great if you're testing uh, uh, it for doing gems. Okay, so Bundle Console. Um, the next tip is tweaking Ruby GC settings. This is a slightly advanced, um, but when I did this, I had amazing results. So uh, there's a uh, list, there's examples on there, 4,064 examples. 
Before tweaking those settings, it took two and a half minutes. After that, it's one minute less than that. Okay, so it's a, about a 50, 40, 43 percent increase. So what you can do is there are three settings in there. I won't go through the the, uh, the meanings of each of them. Go to that blog post, uh, Fitness blog. He'll explain everything that uh, that you need to tweak. This doesn't require you to compile uh, Ruby. All it does is you can just change the environment uh, settings. Uh, just tweak the environment uh, variables in your uh, RC file, whatever whatever um, whatever shell you use. Okay, so if you just change those. In this block, it gives you some uh, example settings, but it's great because it really speeds up tests. Is this specific to a Ruby version or...? I think MRI, sorry. But is it like 1.9 or 2 as well? I don't know. I know it works in 2, I know it works in 1, 193. Okay. I don't know whether it works in, in before. I, I suspect it's introduced somewhere between 1.8 and 1.9 and 4. But this is great. Okay. I think the variable names have changed from all the Ruby versions. They, where there's one that they changed the naming. Okay. I think in one day, so I'm working on it. Okay. The comment is that some of these uh, variable names may have changed between one eight one nine. So these these are one nine and two point uh, names. Okay. The last tip, I think Winston's going to be very happy. What what I do is when I so sort of muck around with Ruby, I I just make little notes myself in Evernote and I type them random Ruby tips. <laughs> so I suggest that you do that as well and volunteer for the next talk. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, that's the end for today's meetup. Please feel free to continue to stay here and linger around. I'll still be staying here for a while. Uh, so as I mentioned, in December, we'll have an uh, engineer talk and a GitHub talk. Uh, engineer talk would actually be remote. Uh, it's away in the US. Uh, they are sponsored for the pizza, so they would like to give a talk as well. So, uh, sorry? Is it dark no, uh, uh, PJ Agrity. Yeah. yeah, so you will be doing a remote thing. Uh, I still need to figure out how to set it up. Um, GitHub Michael Harris will be here. He's from Australia. Um, so I'm sure he'll have some freebies to give away. He'll be talking about GitHub workflow or something. Um, so that will be on a Tuesday, <coughs> December 17th. Um, and on a Thursday, from what I've heard, he'll be organizing a GitHub drinks session somewhere. So I don't know where. Uh, maybe he will only give up the dream coupons if you come to the meetup. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, so uh, stay tuned for the further updates for the December to meetup. All right. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Michael, for helping to do the video recording. Please go and ask him what what's up with engineers.sg. I think it's a very uh, brilliant idea of this. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Oh, before I forget, I, I always forget. So just now there were people who want to push it and they were hiring, right? Uh, do you guys want to give like a two minutes pitch for your company? I'll, I'll just give a couple of seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm from Maxis, yeah. and Maxis is a digital media agency. We build prototypes for clients like L'Oreal, Morocco, uh, Bea, and so on. Uh, we build prototypes like you know, hardware prototypes based on Arduino. I, we even do business with the intelligence tools like visualizations on the platform such as Ruby uh, and Ruby and Rails predominantly. Um, also, there's a little bit of uh, integration with enterprise kind of stuff. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, in the capacity of being a freelancer or full time, please let me know. It's a great place to work. You can do anything from like hardware to software, go back up and down, even uh, open source to uh, integration with like uh, enterprise level kind of like Microsoft technologies. So I'll just be here after the introductions, kind of talk to me if you have some free time. Um, yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Um, hey, I'm actually I've only been in Singapore for a week, so uh, I have to see some just moved from Australia. Um, I'm the managing director at NEO, which oh. I guess means just I'm working, I'm pairing with uh, Carl, actually. And uh, we're hiring, so everyone from uh, juniors, uh, Sort of median uh, developers and uh, senior developers. Uh, we're looking for well, not just great engineers, but like amazing makers. Um, we've got. I am actually blown away by the team. We've got an amazing team, and uh, we actually make some new stories. <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, a heap of clients that we uh, really need to build out for. So we've got projects that are uh, going to be starting. We've got some going on in Indonesia right now, here in Singapore, of course, uh, and a couple of prospects in Hong Kong and Australia. So 
Um, the expression is about, uh, you know, we build in Rails, preferentially. Um, JavaScript, uh, Java if we have to. And, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, and we're looking for people. So best way to get a hold of us, um, we actually have a process for going through people, jobs.sg at neo.com, or just come in and speak to me directly and I'll look in the something more. Thanks. Oh, do you want to get hired? Do you want to pitch yourself? No. <laughs> okay, if not, that's really the end. I hope I didn't forget anything. Nothing, right? Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, I have also one thing. Sorry, just in, in case anyone else is, uh, there's actually an R meetup tomorrow. So uh, if you, any of you guys are data scientists, um, I know that my original foray into where I really came from, doing a lot of uh, sort of large uh, data warehousing and uh, data science crunching. Um, there's going to be an R meetup that uh, we're hosting at uh, Neo tomorrow at seven o'clock. So if you'd like to go along to that, there's usually over that. Um, you know, also if you do Python, you actually want to show up as well. So sorry. No, no worries. You have been here. So go if you want to be here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye bye.